So now we want to move to the next phase of a bioinformatics workflow. So in the previous um, session, we've learned how to potentially get data that you want to run. And now we want to show you how to do some basic pre-processing and analysis of uh, next generation sequencing data, again, focusing on ancient metastronomics. Um, shoot the slide. So in this session, we're going to cover uh, or introduce a pipeline called Inner Port Eager that we're only focusing on that because that is what we use in-house and uh, I was one of the developers for that. The, the concepts we will cover today in many cases will be applicable to other pipelines you may come across. Um, so don't think that you are required to use Inner Port Eager or we suggest that is just what we preferentially prefer to use. We'll go through the steps of the pipeline um, and so describing sort of what we're doing in basic terms because many of them will be recapped in the rest of the summer school. We'll then go through how to build uh, an airport eager command, so you have to run the pipeline. Uh, Megan has also prepared some top tips for eager success mm -hmm. as an extensive user of the pipeline, so it gives some tips on how to uh, make your experience uh, even nicer. And then I will go through um, the output of NFCO Eager um, and sort of describing what you should be looking for based on the, out the output of the different tools that are in the pipeline. Again, which you will often find in um, different. Um, so many of the cool tools are very common across many different contexts. Okay. So before we start, because we encountered some issues in the Git session. I would like everyone to open their, their VM and open their terminal and please change into slash vol slash volume. And then please indicate with thumbs up if you've done that. Oh, you can also do that if you want. So uh, Megan will also do this alongside us. So you can see what I'm doing. Is everyone in your volume directory? Trey, Kerry, Merlin. So I'll make sure everyone's there. UT, Emily, Tias, Dario, make a few more. Sierra, Laura, Jamie. Good. Okay. So now please run LS. And what I would hope you can see is what Megan's already got on the screen there is a bunch of blue directories um, and lost and found. If you only see lost and found, can you please also raise your hand? Okay, so if you only see lost and found, I need you to run the next commands which are on the slides. So if you're making a switch back to there. You're going to have to firstly run this wget command. Um, so cop please copy and paste that across. So Megan will maybe do that. Can you? Uh, copy. Or, wait, I know I can do that. I'll do that. Okay. Give me one second. I will paste the command into the Gather Town chat. This is going to download uh, the data that we need. So normally we would. Um, have this already for you, but I think there was some confusion at the end of the session yesterday. Uh, read says 2D and 2D are still red and not pause. Okay, so for read, if to, uh, for 2D, can you run the next command, the tar xvf? But everybody else, please, can you run this wget command I just put in the Gather Town chat? Who, again, if you've already got all of the directories, you're fine. If you do not, if you only have lost and found, Sorry, you must run this command. This is gonna download the data that we're gonna to run today. It's gonna to take about 20 minutes, I think, to download. So we're gonna leave that running. Um, and then before the command, we will recap the other two. Um, a tar is very similar to a zip file. It's just an archive. So once that is downloaded, we'll uh, unzip or decompress the tar file and then, delete, and then delete the tar and then we should be good to go. So please at least start be running this wkit get command already. Um, but otherwise, we'll start now with the rest of the presentation from Megan. Is that from Rick and questions? Is there still questions, or is that from earlier? So UT or Nora, have you got problems? Luis. Or Luis? OK, I think we're OK. So. 
You're downloading, downloading, good. Okay, so you should be seeing some download sort of a status bar. If you're not seeing that, please let me know and I might I can come and help you. So otherwise I'll hand it over now to Megan. Meet yourself. Okay. Oh. Test, test. Okay, everyone can hear me all right? Yeah? Great. Okay. Um, cool. So while that's downloading, we'll go ahead with our introduction and I would encourage you like last time, if you want, put your cameras on, interrupt me, ask questions um, uh, as they come up um, and feel free also to type in the chat. So I'll keep an eye on that. Um, okay, so first of all, we're gonna start out by talking about what is a computational pipeline. Um, so eager is just one type, like one example of a computational pipeline, but in general, a pipeline is a series of linked steps um, where the output of one step forms the input of the next step. So in this little cartoon here, process A is something that runs on your computer and the output of process A is detected by your computer and becomes the input of process B and so on. So um, it's automated and the inputs and outputs get passed between the processes sort of without you having to do that manually. Um, so why do we need pipelines? So in general, ancient DNA as a field is expanding really quickly, both in the number of genomes we have and in the types of analyses we're trying to perform. So here's a little graph from the Reich Lab at HMS showing the huge increase in the number of human genomes that have been analyzed. And all this data means that we need new, more efficient approaches for analyzing it um, so that it doesn't take months and years to complete. In addition to the sheer number of genomes we're trying to analyze, we also are starting to attempt more and more different types of analyses. So these are some charts from SPAM showing um, microbiome samples, um, pathogen genome samples, and environmental metagenomes. And with all of these types of analyses, we also need different tools um, to sort of have different approaches. So yeah, as I said, our field is growing in terms of number of samples and types of analyses. And all of this means that we need to continuously develop new tools and methods and computational approaches to keep up. So pipelines are our solution to these changes that are happening in our field. Um, and NF Core is just one, NF Core Eager is just one example of this pipeline approach, but there are other great options um, such as Paleomix and others. And I think I put a link to the Paleomix paper in the um, resources for today's course, if you're interested also to check that out. But NF Core Eager will be our focus today, as James already said. So an introduction to NF Core Eager. What is it? <laughs> um, it's a computational pipeline that's specifically designed with ancient DNA data in mind. Um, and it's sort of a spin-off of this original pipeline, Eager, um, which stands for Efficient Ancient Gen Genome Reconstruction, which was published by Peltzer et al. back in 2016. Um, there's also a link to that paper in the resources for today. Um, so NF Core Eager is a re-implementation of this pipeline using NextFlow, um, which is a, a language sort of specifically designed for bioinformatics processing. And I would just um, highlight some sort of features of NF Core Eager that we're gonna talk about in some more detail that are things that we think are advantageous about this new approach. And that's portability, reproducibility, and updated functionality. So um, I'll go through each of these in some detail. So first of all, portability. Why do we care about portability? Um, this is important because we're all working on different systems, maybe our local laptops, maybe HPCs, um, like a cluster, um, but all of these are going to be slightly different. And having portability in our pipelines facilitates reproducible analysis by ensuring that we're all using the same tools, the same versions of those tools, um, we have the same dependencies in the same environment so that we can get the same results no matter where we're running our analysis. Um, it also provides easy access to pipeline tools. So anyone who's worked in ancient DNA bioinformatics has probably had uh, dependency issues at some point in your life, and those are not fun. So 
like versions of tools that don't work together. And um, hopefully with pipelines and portability, we can uh, make those much fewer and less painful. Um, and it also facilitates use across platforms. So on clusters, PCs, or cloud computing, for instance. So how does NF Core Eager approach portability? Um, mostly through containerization. So this is the concept of distributing uh, in a self-contained package or bundle all the code, the packages, the programs, the libraries that you need to run the analysis, even the environment all together, um, so that you only have to sort of install or download one thing. And NF Core Eager is compatible with multiple um, containers, so Docker, Conda, and Singularity, to name a few. Um, and today we're going to be running with Conda, but you can read a lot more about this online and decide when you want to run your own analyses, how you want to approach that. So second is reproducibility. Um, and in terms of reproducibility, NF Core Eager offers customizable configuration profiles. There are sort of multiple levels of this. So the highest level would be HPC cluster level profiles. Um, these are profiles that are usable with all Nextflow pipelines, and they're configuring things like how jobs are submitted on your specific computing system um, so that the pipeline works well with whatever cluster or what have you that you're using. Sort of on a more specific level, we have pipeline level profiles, um, and these specify um, particular analytical options that we want to use to make our analyses more reproducible. So you could actually even share these alongside your publication, for instance, via GitHub to make it really easy for other people to replicate your analysis with the exact parameters you use. And incidentally, it also makes it a lot easier to write your methods section if you're publishing your profile with all of the options. Um, so that's kind of a nice bonus. So lastly is updated functionality. Um, and so NF Core Eager is a new pipeline and it incorporates a lot more tools compared to the original version of Eager. So this is a schematic and we're going to talk a lot more in detail about sort of what this means and what the steps that NF Core Eager incorporates are. But everything in green is a new sort of tool that is incorporated compared to the original version. And a lot of these are things that have been designed by people in the ancient DNA field specifically for working in ancient DNA. And I would just highlight um, sort of this top bit here, which is all about working with ancient metagenomics, which is what we're all here and interested in. So it's really cool that um, NF Core Eager incorporates um, removal of host DNA, complexity filtering, metagenomic screening, um, all of these things that we're interested in that weren't in the previous version. And we're going to talk about that in more detail as well. So that's our brief introduction, and now I'd like to move into steps in the pipeline or how to read the tube map, which is um, this little schematic here that looks sort of like a subway system, um, but is actually a graphical representation of what NF Core Eager can do. So sort of to orient ourselves, and we're going to walk through this together, um, this pipeline starts from some standardized input files. And there are different pathways that we can take through this pipeline. So if you look at this legend, there are different types of analyses that we might want to perform in ancient DNA. Maybe we're working with eukaryotic nuclear genomes. You might follow sort of the red path through this, um, this subway map. Um, if you're working with microbial single genomes, you might be interested in the tools in yellow. Or if you want to perform metagenomic profiling, the blue line but we're gonna walk through all of these together. So first of all, all of these analysis paths share some standard input files. And these are things that James talked about in his lecture on next generation sequencing data yesterday. So NF Core Eager can start from raw FASTQ files, such as you might get off your sequencing machine. Um, we can also start from align, like re, uh, alignments in BAM format. Um, and of course, we also need a reference in FASTA format for most of the analyses that we're going to talk about. So all of this data needs to be pre-processed, and NF Core Eager incorporates some different tools for doing that. 
So we have adapter removal for clipping of adapters and merging of paired end reads. Um, and we, uh, and of course, Eager uses fast QC for quality control, both before and after the clipping, which is really important. And we'll see that more later. Another really cool feature of NF Core Eager is that it uses input text files to facilitate integration of multiple data types into a single Eager run. So if you remember back to this morning's session, we could actually download this TSV directly from the AM Dirt or AM Dirty tool. Um, and uh, this is really nice because it incorporates like things like sample name, library ID, but also things that are important for how we can process our sequencing data. So whether they're paired end or single end, what the color chemistry is, um, this will be really important as we'll see later. So after our pre-processing, we need to map our reads. Um, this is sort of an important step for basically all of the paths that you would follow through the NF Core Eager pipeline. Um, and of course, Eager offers configurable mapping parameters, which is something we're going to talk a lot about mapping uh, Alina and Alexander on day four. Um, there's also removal of duplicate reads so that we don't get artificially inflated coverages or um, errors in uh, genotype calling. And we can also actually analyze off target host, off target DNA. Sorry, that's a typo which is really helpful. For instance, if we're mapping to the human genome, we can then take all of those reads that don't map that belong to our metagenome and analyze those separately. Uh, metagenomic profiling is a new addition in NF Core Eager compared to the previous version, as I mentioned. Um, and this is something that is gonna be talked a lot about tomorrow as well. There are also multiple quality control steps um, that are really useful for ADNA. Most of them are ancient DNA specific. So for instance, looking at ancient DNA damage profiles, um, if you're working with human data, um, uh, tools for looking at contamination are automatically or incorporated if you sort of select those various options. So there's a lot of flexibility there. There are multiple different genotyping approaches and additional analyses that you can perform with the pipeline, depending on your specific organism and your research questions. Um, and lastly, MultiQC is a tool that it forms an integrated HTML report that summarizes the output of all of these steps in a really handy single file. And James is going to talk a lot about that in the practical portion at the end, so stay tuned. So that was our sort of brief overview of the pipeline. Does anyone have any questions so far? Can raise your hand, unmute, type in the chat. Seems not. So I'll move along with the practical portion, which is how to build an eager command. Oops, sorry. Um, but first of all, so we're going to be doing some actual analysis of real data, and I wanted to just give you like a brief slide about what that data actually is. So we have downloaded for you some um, Yersinia pestis sequencing data from ENA, and here's just a little table showing what that is. So we have two different samples from these sites, um, one Neolithic Siberian sample and one from Iron Age Kazakhstan. This is publicly available data. Um, and for each sample, we have two different libraries. Um, yes. So what we actually want to do with this data is to trim the adapters and merge the reads to align those reads to the Yersinia pestis reference genome and figure out what our endogenous DNA percentage is, how much of the DNA that we're looking at is actually from Y pestis. I forgot to say that this is targeted capture data. So um, we've already enriched for DNA um, that corresponds to the Yersinia pestis genome. Then we're going to filter our BAM files to remove the host DNA. We're going to perform deduplication um, so that we have more accurate coverage estimation and genotyping. And then we want to merge these files by sample and perform genotyping on that combined data set. So that sounds like a lot, but we can do it with one command, <laughs> which is really nice and the advantage of a pipeline. 
Okay, so now's the point where um, we should transition to opening up our terminal windows. So if you can all open your, your terminals um, and we wanna activate the Conda environment for today's session that has all the tools that we're gonna need for this analysis. So if you open your window and type Conda activate git eager. You may already be in that environment if you were, um, if you in earlier. So if you didn't close your terminal, you should already see that. Could I also have an update of who is still downloading their input data? How, how long did the state estimate? Oh, Jesus. OK. I mean, what we can do is walk through the command and is the... Yeah, okay, so let's just walk through the command and, and we'll see how we're going to do I mean, basically what we're going to do is one command. So we'll walk through the parts of it and what it's actually doing. And if your data is still downloading, that's fine. We have a report that we can show you and you can run it on your own system later, I would say. So uh, before we execute, we'll check. Right yeah, there. before we execute, we'll, we'll check where you're at. But um, you are you may already be in this location. If you have this directory, you can change into it. If not, for as for the last one, we can just work in our downloads folder. So just make sure that you're located in a place in the file system where you want to be. You can also always check where you are by using PWD for print working directory. Mm -hmm. So everyone good? Okay, let's get started. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that NF Core Eager is up to date on our system. So we'll download the latest version of the repository or it will update if you've already downloaded it. So you can use this command, nextflow pull NF Core Eager. So if you can all type that and press enter, you should see something like checking and that it has downloaded a revision or you're already up to date. Should already be installed on your systems. So, but it's always a good practice to make sure that you haven't missed a version. Great. I'm just gonna put that in the chat in case anyone's a bit behind. So once we've done that, we can start actually compiling our command. And so just don't press enter until we've made it all the way through the command. And I'm going to walk through the parts um, one bit at a time. So the first thing that you're going to want to type is here in orangish, yellowish, nextflow run nfcore eager. And so this command is actually telling nextflow that we want to execute this specific pipeline nfcore eager. So again, don't press enter. So the next part that we need to type is this dash R. This specifies which version of the eager pipeline we wanna to use to execute our analysis. This is a good practice just to make sure that, for instance, for a paper or something like that, we're using the same version of the pipeline every time we run it. You can also use this little flag currently to specify which version of Nextflow we're using. Um, this isn't going to be necessary when we release when a new version of Eager is released, but for now, you should use that. So the next thing you're going to add is here in yellow, um, profile conda. And as we talked about a little bit before, Profiles specify like what analytical options we want to use, but they also are specific for our computing environment so that we can sort of correctly submit jobs to whatever system we're using. And so here we're going to use um, Conda for containerization. But this might be different on your specific system. So the next thing we have to do is specify a reference in FASTA format. And I have this stored 
or I just realized this is going to be different for people who are working in a different directory. Yeah. Where is it stored? Or they don't have it, actually. They wouldn't have it stored. OK, yeah. So for those of you who are still downloading data, you don't have this file yet. <laughs> but for those of you who do have the data, um, this FASTA file is already on your system. Sorry, it's kind of a long thing to type. but. I'm going to move on, but we'll make sure that you've had time to type everything at the end. So then we specify an input TSV, or we specify our input either in TSV, so tab separated value format, or using wildcards, but we'll talk about that in a second. So you can do that like this, dash dash input, and your input TSV that I already made for you should be in the directory you're working in. We want to filter unmapped reads um, that don't map to the Ypestis genome, and we can save those in a fast queue. This is useful if you're interested in analyzing the metagenome or what other DNA might be in your sample. So we do that with run BAM filtering, and then we have to specify the format that we want our output data in. So in this case, fast queue. Then we want to run genotyping with the um, unified genotyper, the GATK unified genotyper. And we do that using this command. Hmm? Ah, OK, GATK, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and lastly, we want to generate some variant calling statistics using run BCF tools stats. That's the whole command. So once you finish with all that typing, you can, well, I guess you should only try to execute this if you've actually downloaded your data and are working in the right directory. Otherwise, it won't actually work. But if you have the data downloaded it downloaded and you're in the correct directory, then once you finish typing all this, you can press enter. Can you actually paste that into the chat? Mm -hmm. Could I also have the status update who's still downloading? Nora has an old option F requires an argument. Oh, uh, that's what? Okay, so um, one second, Nora. Don't worry if you aren't, don't have time to run the command. I'm going to send another thing which allows you to do the second half of this the practical session. So don't don't worry about that. Um, so let me send post paste the command for you. Maybe I, I should actually show what it's going to look yeah, like. Yeah. So then let me do that. that then for no forty minutes. Jesus. Just a second while everyone's getting caught up. Give me one second. Uh... I had no such file as that, uh, as the file we were turning to. Okay. Um, were you in the directory for today's session? Uh, yes, and I had done the download of the 2D. So you have to go to the eager direct subdirectory. Mm -hmm. I was in the, the eager subdirectory. Oh. Could you share your screen? Mm -hmm. uh, Nora, make sure to have like an extra space or something. So it should literally just be tar xp f, and then you try star tar. But that's only going to work if the download's completed. 
Uh, okay, so the... Sorry, the file name, I updated it and I changed the name to underscore update. So that's the issue there, sorry. Uh, um, so if you can just retype, yeah, exactly. If you do the up arrow for your command and then you scroll over to the input. Oh wait, it does say update there. Yeah. Can you copy the name of the file and then run ls in the directory that you're currently in? Um, there must be a typo somewhere. So if I Sorry, do the error for the reference or the TSP file? Oh, it's for the the reference. You up one more? Hmm? You up one more? Up yep. one more to see the dot dot? Okay, sorry, go up. Um, There's a CD dot dot? Yeah. I'm going to ref uh, CD reference. So what you can say if you go back into the eager directory. So if you bring up your command again. Can you go back to faster, the faster section? Mm -hmm. Uh, can you um, delete the, the path, basically, and then we'll try and also complete it instead? We might have to outside the quotes to begin with. Yeah, outside quotes? Is yeah, so it delete, delete the quotes, mm -hmm. then dot dot, slash, reference, and try and also complete the tab. And then yeah, so that's there. And then could you wrap that in quotes again, single quotes? And by executing. <coughs> yeah, that's what oh, I'm brilliant. Doing. That looks better. OK, thank what you. The quotes. Oh, is it the city? You've got the city map quotes. Ah. So one moment. So if you're having problems with file not found, this is because Mac and apparently now Google have used silly curly quotes rather than straight quotes. And <laughs> if you use like a like Word or Google Docs, it seems to convert this nowadays, which is a bit annoying. I think it should. So maybe, if you use double quotes, I think it should be okay. Let me yeah. let me just try it, and then I'll show you on my screen what I'm running. That's you. You are you don't you you don't eager in this case. Huh? You're just in the two C directory. Oh. Okay, yeah. So this is a, so don't worry if you have this issue, this is not you, this is a very common issue with uh, a lot of people. So the command you want to run. Here I can, you have it. Oh, you can do it. And bio, like 90% of bioinformatics is wasted time because you're fixing the silly errors like this. I am posting an update command for you now. Um, for Dario, can, Dario, can you paste the command that you used? If I 
of command I use in there. Yeah. Maybe she has screens. Okay, so I'm just going to double check that I'm in the so. We should all be in this directory. And can't do control B, which I always forget. Still saying that there's no. Uh, Dario, does that, does that also happen with the, the link I sent just now? That would be off now. I think this, yeah. Okay. So it should be working if you. So maybe, I'm gonna you? paste the command that runs into the chat now. So as long as you use that one, it should work. Yeah. You mean? I, so basically, you know what position should be like on the front of Yeah, I think they they can see this one. Right? Yeah. Ah, okay. So the command that you should run, sorry about that, there was a typo, is now in the chat. And I'm just going to show now what, it's look, what it should look like when it's actually running. So who has output like this? Raise your hand. Five people, six, seven. You don't get your hands down. Great. So people still having other issues or other errors? Yeah, if people get errors with the new command, then let me know. Who's <laughs> <laughs> still downloading? About three people. So remember, once you download it, you can do tar xdf and then the tar file. And then you can go into the, that directory that it is untarred and then the directory and try running the command. Should we move on? Uh, we'll, we'll hmm? So we'll wait, wait a few minutes, yeah. Okay, so we'll just wait then while people are catching up. Yeah, feel free to get snacks or drinks. Or something like that. 
Yeah, and if you're still having issues with the command, then unmute and let us know. Yeah. And again, don't panic if you don't get around to running the command. Did you see, see the idea of how it's going to work? It looks like maybe Johnny has a hand up, or is no, that left, left, over. left over? Okay. So, Jamie, could you maybe share your screen? Possibly one directory too high. So if you have CD eager. Yep. Oh, my two for, okay, hold on. I think I, I went back because I thought if I went to reference and so I think I'm back. Or. Yeah, you could, there's another directory called eager itself. Yep. And now try running the command. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so you should be able to copy paste if you if it's still not working, you should be able to copy paste from the chat um, directly into your terminal. And if you're in the right window, hopefully that works. Audrey, do you want to share your screen with us so we can help you? Great. So can you see it? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. So the issue is is that your one directory too high. So if you can um, type cd and then eager. Exactly. Now, if you try to run the command there, it should work. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And so um, the command you've written has many lots of different parameters. Uh, in NFCO eager, these can be three main types. One are numbers, so dash dash, EWA, ALN, N, and then a number like five. Then you can have strings and text, as you've already done with the paths. Um, and you can also have Ones which are simple flags, what I mean is just represents true or false. So if you give the flag, so for example, dash dash the run genotyping, I think it is, that will turn on that step of the pipeline. If you don't supply that, genotyping will not be run. Yeah, I'll have the video. Do you want me to do the top tips while we're waiting? 
Yeah, okay. Great. Okay. So if anyone, if anyone has any other problems, um, please message in the chat and I will help you out and make it continue the presentation. Yeah, so while that's running or while we're finishing downloading, whenever your stuff is done downloading, you can then be, you can start the run. So. Let me just make it full screen. So you see, yeah. Um, so just to review what we've just done. So we started with some raw FastQ files and a reference FASTA. Um, we performed adapter removal and um, read merging. And we did some quality control steps along the way. We mapped our reads to the Yersinia pestis reference genome. Um, from there, we performed deduplication. We also filtered out our host DNA uh, we did damage profiling. I think that's turned on by default, right, James? Yep. Um, and we also performed genotyping using GATK. So we're going to see the output of that in a little bit, but that's what we did with that command. And now we wait. <laughs> okay, so just a little teaser of the other options that are available in NFCore Eager. So you can, for instance, skip various steps. If, say, you downloaded some data that was already adapter trimmed, or you're working with data that was already partially processed for some reason, there are, as James said, flags that allow you to skip specific steps or to turn on specific steps. So you could skip the QC step or skip adapter removal. And for, for any questions about what um, parameters are available, you can check out this link, which I think is also in the resources, but is super useful and outlines basically everything that you can um, turn on and off and what options are available in the pipeline. So you can also, for instance, trim bases from reads in your FASTQ file. So maybe you're working with UDG half data, you've already looked at the damage signature, and you really want to map those reads with stricter mapping parameters, for instance. You can actually clip bases from the beginning and ends of your reads um, and then map without those damaged bases. So you would do that like with this command. You can also adjust mapping parameters. And this is something that Alina and Alexander are gonna talk about. So for instance, you might want to adjust your mapping stringency for single stranded libraries with lots of damage or um, for other purposes. Um, yes, sorry, questions in the chat, but it looks like James is about that. <laughs> and there are a lot more and more, many more options. Um, so if you go on the documentation page, you can actually see all of those. Um, and it's really helpful because you see how you can turn them on, sort of, um, you can click these little help buttons for various parameters to see what the different options are. And there's just a lot that you can do. Um, and you get some documentation about what all the different flags are for. So I would recommend checking that out. So our top tips for eager success while the command is running. Um, first tip is for screen sessions. So depending on the type of input data and what analyses you want to run, this could take um, hours or even days or weeks. So we don't want to tie up our computers completely while we're doing that. So to avoid crashes due to loss of power or say disconnecting from your cluster system, you can run NFCore Eager in a screen or TMUX session. So you can do that um, by typing something like screen-r eager and you'll enter a screen session called eager and you can actually run the command from that. When you're ready to disconnect, you type um, control AD for the screen sessions. Um, and this will continue to run in the background so that you can work on the computer or on the cluster as normal and you don't uh, crash your program in the middle. So that's really helpful. We also have multiple ways to supply input data. So one way is wildcards, and this is useful for sort of simple input data um, and is a fast way that we can perform our analysis. 
So you might want to use this if you have data from the same sequencing or instrument and configuration that's stored in a common location and you have, say, one file per sample. Um, and so you can use wildcards like this. So you have your double dash input um, flag. And then instead of specifying a sample name, you use a star to indicate sort of all files with this ending in that particular location. And Eager will recognize all those files and take them all as input. You can also use input TSVs. That's what we're doing. They're more powerful and flexible in many ways. Um, and with these files, you supply the pipeline with details on the type of input data that you have and the samples themselves. And when you do this, and of course, Eager can sort of intelligently, quote unquote, apply analyses to certain files only. So for instance, you put in the TSV, whether your data is paired end or single end. And if it's paired end, you would then run merging. Or if your data comes from a next seek, maybe you want to perform polyG trimming. Um, so NF4 Eager can automatically apply those to only specific samples. This is also an efficient way of merging output by library and sample. So it's useful when there are multiple samples per individual, as with our data set. So we can have um, files merged by sample name, and then we have all our data together. So input TSVs are more flexible. Um, if your uh, command isn't running anymore or later, you can always check what the input TSV file looks like by running cat ancient metagenome deer eager input dot TSV. Um, this should actually be underscore update, <laughs> but yeah. So I'll put that in the chat for later. And you can take a look at what that looks like. So moving on, you can also get um, a report by email. If your cluster system has um, mail set up, then you can actually get the multi-QC report, the HTML file, um, emailed directly to you. And it's also kind of handy because it tells you when your run has finished and you should go back and look at it. So you can do that with this uh, flag, the email flag, and then just enter your email in quotes, not the Mac quotes, but regular quotes. So tip four is to check out the Eager GUI, so the graphical user interface. And you can do that by going to this website here whenever you want. Um, and this is cool because you can actually set up a run using the graphical user interface. So for all of the parameters, you can type in, for instance, the path to your input file. Um, you can use the question mark to get more details on what specific parameters do. There are drop down menus for flags with only certain options or little radio buttons if it's a true false sort of um, parameter. So this is really useful for getting to know the program and what's available. And if you're a little less comfortable on the command line, I recommend checking that out. Um, tip five, when something fails, all is not lost. So when an individual job in your pipeline fails, um, most of the time, NF Core Eager will automatically resubmit this job with higher memory um, and CPU requirements. So this is really nice, like if on your computing system, uh, it fails for lack of memory, you'll just submit again with higher memory and it won't crash the whole pipeline. This can happen up to two times per job for most jobs by default. Also, sometimes the pipeline crashes. That just happens at some point. Um, and you can actually resubmit that run using this resume flag and Nextflow will retrieve cached results from processes that were successful. So say you crashed on the metagenomic analysis step, but um, all of the cached results from adapter removal, mapping, et cetera, can be um, rescued, then you don't have to perform all those processes again, which is super nice. 
So this saves both time and computational resources and is really handy. So tip six, um, if you start to use this more regularly, it's a feature I really like. Um, and of course, Eager can integrate with the NextFlow tower, which is a way of sort of monitoring and keeping track of your jobs. So you can see what command was run um, for specific jobs. You can look at what parameters you ran. This can be super useful when you're going back and trying to write your method section. Um, you can look at how many processes are currently running and how many have succeeded and failed, as well as sort of which jobs um, are at what stage. So we have, uh, for instance, adapter removal running or something failed, you'll see that. Um, and you can even select specific jobs. So like adapter removal and see the actual command that would be run on the command line if you were doing this by hand, basically is really useful for debugging. So you can check out more information and how to integrate that um, at this URL. So that's what I have. Okay. So how many people are still running? A lot. OK, if you have not been able to run into the tool, um, just uh, we'll skip that for today. I am going to now share different commands to get the, the one half of file we're going to look at today. In the second half of the session, but I will need you to run. Uh, let me just double check this is correct. Or I see it Do you want me to stop share? Um, So this will not take 20 minutes. I just hope not. It's a three seconds tops. So I would like you all. So for those who have um, not got a completed eager run, so it, it, if you're running the pipeline or um, it's just not run at all, you still got a tar. I'd like you to open a new terminal, so you can right-click on the terminal icon at the bottom. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, press, yes, just click on the terminal at the bottom again, just with a normal click. I would like you to run the following command, which I'll paste in the chat. So firstly, please run go to downloads. Oh, great, good at this. And then once you have changed the directory, and again, only if your pipeline is still running or you haven't got to run at all, please run this command. And then I will start the next section. So we can switch. Yeah. So do you still have the VM? I'm not sharing screen at the moment. One moment. Okay, so um, what you're looking at now, as Megan has said, is basically the, the progress of the pipeline run. And what you should already see, if you have another terminal open, for example, oh, sorry. Uh, you should see a directory called results. If you go into there, you'll see directories like this. So, for example, adapter removal documentation, plus QC public info. And as the pipeline goes along, this will update with more and more steps of the pipeline. Uh, 
right? Can everyone see, see, see my screen, right? Or no? Because I've lost camera. No. No, no. no. Uh, it's not. It's another web browser. It's in web browser. Mm -hmm. Didn't open up in one. Right click on it. And then... Okay, I'll try again. Sorry about that. See my screen now? Yeah, okay. Laura's nodding. Laura's yes. nodding. Okay, cool. So what you should have then been seeing is that. Nope, not that one either. I do not understand Max. Apologies. No. Okay, so it should be something like this. So I've changed into, so I was in the eager uh, directory. I ran eager, the, the pipeline command, and then you should have a directory called results. So if you open the new terminal, so you go to the bottom. Oh. Apologies. You can see here I've opened another terminal. So I opened the other one by clicking the terminal icon here. And then you can change into the directory vol volume 2D introduction to end of core eager and then results. And if it is running, you should start seeing orders like this adapt removal, documentation plus PC, and so on. And this will update over time as the pipeline continues to execute. And this is where we're going to start the next section of the of the uh, talk. Right. right. So what you should see once the pipeline has completely finished. Um, is something like this. So pipeline completed, completed sex, successfully. So hopefully you'll see this at some point. Again, don't worry if you don't, do not get to that point. What we're going to talk about now is how to actually understand the pipeline output um, by going through two things. Firstly, going just very briefly describing the, the common file outputs that you'd use for downstream analyses. I'm not going to go much detail at this because this will be covered in many of the downstream um, or the, the sessions later in the summer school. But what we're going to focus on today is how to quality control your pipeline runs. This is how to um, quality control the sequencing data itself, and then some of the early pre-processing steps that we will have done in the pipeline. So the output files, so what you will want to look for and what you want to, 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 to manipulate depends entirely on the context of your project and what you want to do. So there's four main formats, which you will probably most likely use either one or multiple in any combination. When you're doing genome reconstruction, you'll be interested maybe in fast queue files. So eager produces multiple different types of fast queue files um, to act as sort of intermediate things you can use for other different steps. So for example, if you want to actually remap, but with different parameters, you can reuse the fast queue files, which have already had the adapters removed. Maybe you want to profile with a taxonomic profile not in the pipeline, so you could use the FastQ files there. And also, um, Megan mentioned earlier, there is a host removal script, which basically allows you, let's say you're running human uh, microbiome data and you're not allowed to upload the human data itself because of ethical reasons. Eager can produce for you FastQ files, um, which are basically have all of the human DNA removed. Um, so these are the various FastQ files you can get. You can also get BAM files, and most likely you don't use the, the ones coming out of deduplication. So this is normally the folder that would be named Mark Duplicates. Um, this is the one that has been has had your reads aligned against some form, some form of ref reference genome, and you may want to look at the alignments themselves. Um, this is see stacking, so basically where you have lots of reads falling in one place. Um, you would also use a BAM file if you want to do manual variant calling so, or genotyping, where you're calling um, SNPs which you may want to use for manual phylogenetic analysis. And also the BAM file is what is used as input in for damage patterns calculations. BCF files, you're only going to really be interested in this if you're wanting to do phylogenomic analysis, like 
uh, building trees. This is what actually contains the SNPs and variants and genotypes and so on. And also, if you've gone one step further, and this is probably only you're going to do this if you've done either mitochondrial or organelle sort of um, genome reconstruction or microbial genome reconstruction, uh, eGIF can also produce a multi sequence alignment in faster format for you. And this is what you normally would use as input to phylogenetic analysis. Then, if you're doing microbiome reconstruction, um, it's what I normally would be using. I would be taking the TSV files, so tabs separated value uh, text files that you get out of Malt or Kraken. Um, and these are two two tables you'd use in downstream steps for whatever you want to do. However, for every context um, of engine DNA that you'd maybe apply N of course eager onto, we'd be running the multi QC, uh, looking at the multi QC output. So, if your pipeline run has finished, what you should see entirely uh, is a, sorry if the yeah if the pipeline is finished completely. You should see all of these direct DOEs here. If you were to go through some of them, you'll see these BAM files or FASTA files or FASTQ files I've mentioned just before. Um, but before we would want to actually look through all of these and find all of these types of files, we want to make sure that actually the pipeline executed correctly. There's no weird mistakes or errors or artifacts in your data, which may cause problems downstream. So essentially, you want to check, does everything look normal before you start processing this data? Now, before I go through this, this next section is going to be a little bit dry, so I apologize in advance. Um, a lot of what I'm going to show now takes just experience and practice to learn, to identify what is bad or what looks weird. It sort of takes a somewhat amount of intuition. Um, so don't, so yeah, it might get a little bit tedious, so I apologize in advance. Um, but I hope that by showing you how to the way I think about things as we go through the different sections of the multi-QC report, you will have an idea of what to look for yourself. And you can always come back to this, the slides or the video in the future. So the things that will be examples of things we'll be looking for in terms of quality controlling your, your data is things like, did your sequencing run go well? So did you get your money's worth? So if you submitted and asked to your sequencing facility, I want 10 million reads, did you get the 10 million reads? You also want to look, do you have any artifacts after let's say adapter trimming? So did you sufficiently remove all the adapters or do you still have some left? So obviously, as we talked the other day, um, if you have lots of adapters installed in your sequence, you may end up getting uh, lots of hits to the carp genome in taxonomic profiling, even if you've got, I don't know, some Antarctic polar bear sample. Um, you, you can also use MultiQC to check, do you have sufficient coverage? So do you have a lot of reads covering your genome in a way that you can reliably call variants uh, for phylogenetic analysis? You also want to check, do you actually have damage? As Tina emphasized earlier on, the, one of the only real reliable ways of detecting you have proper ancient DNA, if you've not run damage removal in the lab, is to check for damage. And we also want to check, can we sequence more? So in some many cases, you may want to have extra coverage and you can actually use the, your screening data to actually estimate how much more you should sequence. And also check for contamination. Do you find that, for example, in your um, uh, varying calls, do you have weird mi mixes of um, multi-allelic positions where you have multiple variants even though you have only a haploid genome. So these are the various things that we can look through in the multi-QC report. So I am going to go through step by step the multi-QC report we would have generated now or you would have just downloaded. Um, again, this is going to be a bit tight, dry and tedious, I apologize in advance, but at any point in the future you want to come back and revisit this, your friend is always going to be the NF Core eager documentation. Um, we've spent a lot of time, and it's one thing to maybe I'm most proud of because it sort of makes Eager stand out from a lot of other pipelines is just how extensive we have written the description of what everything looks like. So you can just see just me scrolling how much text, and then we've even got images here in the, in the documentation. So all of this you can go back to at any point. When you yourselves become engine DNA masters, you are welcome to actually reuse any of these images and all of this text for your own teaching material because it's all released under a Creative Commons license. So you just have to cite um, the eager team, the eager paper, um, uh, and you're then otherwise welcome to manipulate, play around, use it for your own uh, personal purposes. You also get a copy of all this documentation in every pipeline run. So if you go into uh, see the pipeline, I think, documentation, or even just documentation, a copy of that will be there as well. 
Um, and like I said, we have these nice little car schematic cartoon diagrams which are meant to act as these quick references. Uh, in fact, what Tina was showing you earlier today with the damage profiles of what you should be looking for. So it says, well, if you've got modern DNA, it should look like this. If you've got ancient DNA, it should look like this. Or if there's some problem and it looks like this, then maybe you should be a bit careful and go check. And this also should help you um, get a better understanding of what you should be looking for. So moving on to multi-QC. Um, what is multi-QC? I've mentioned it multiple times already. Uh, I still consider it partially witchcraft. Um, it is a, an amazing tool which, given a directory, and this can be of your own, own analysis results. It doesn't have to be an output of eager. It can be out of output of Pelumix. It can be run as one tool. Um, and you just give it that directory or file. It'll then read in all the log files and all of the statistics files that it may find and then convert that, um, if the tool is supported, into a nice summary output um, all in one single one report. So you don't have to go through hundreds of PDF files or hundreds of log files to basically get all the statistics. It gathers it all up for you, aggregates it, and displays it in a very, very nice manner. So if you have a complete pipeline run, you can change into your um, volume instruction to in a eager directory. Or if you've downloaded with the commands I just sent about uh, 10 minutes ago in the chat, uh, you can then, once you're in those directories, run Firefox and then multi underscore, underscore report.html. I can show you what this should look like in my own window. So the pipeline is still running. Yeah, so we'll leave that running. If we go in here, sorry, one more. You see, here I've got my multi QT report. And I can run Firefox multi QT, and you should have your browser window opening as we did with uh, Amdirty earlier on. So you should see something like this. If you have not had your eager run completed, or you were not able to run it at all, I'm going to copy the commands that command you should, would need to do. So if I quickly go back to my terminal. I'll cancel this. So, oops. So I would go pay CD into my so in the download folder, a bunch of stuff from earlier. I then run the wget command. I could learn how to use a Mac touch pad. Here, paste, you should see something like this, and this should be almost instant, like this. With here, you should see multi QT report. I'll run Firefox, multi QT report, and it should have it like this. So, has everyone been able to open their multi QC report? Put your hands up if you have. So the, the pipeline should automatically execute it for you, Merlin. But if you wanted to run it yourself, uh, assuming you have it installed, you would be able to go like this. We have the terminal. Moment. Genius is about to open, so I get the wrong thing. So if you wanted to run your own multi QC report, you could go, for example, so I'm going to activate this. Okay, normally, you would not have to do this. 
But if you want to run it yourself, you could go something. Oh, you found the Montague's Hugh directly. Okay. So if you still run it, then I'll skip that. You can learn how to go read the, the Montague's documentation if you're interested to learn how to run it yourself. So I was here. There we go. So this is the multi QC report. Um, I will now basically go through step by step of each section of the report and describe what sort of things you will be looking for. Um, I suggest you basically scroll through this with me at the same time. I'm going to go back to the slides, but you should be able to work out approximately where we are based on the images that I'll be showing. Is there anyone who's not been able to open it? Nora said she was having some trouble running MultiQC, but I guess, does that mean the download is taking a while, Nora, or the, the pipeline is still running? Yeah, it. I'm not sure. But hands up anyone who's not been able to open it. Pipeline is still running. In that case, you can download the report that we generated for you using the wget command. Okay, and also if you already have the directory, if you open a new terminal and go to the 2D instruction to eager directory, you should already actually have the multi-QC report. You don't have to download it. Yeah, but they shouldn't have to. If they're running the pipeline, they don't have to necessarily do that unless, unless they uh, do not have the volume stuff. Oh, no. So reminder, if you go to C volume, volume and to the to either, I think it is, you may already have a multi QT report in there. If you did not have to do the whole tar thing. Anyway. So when you first open the multi QC report. The first thing I would like to do is just put your cursor around, place it over different things, and click on buttons and things like that. And what you should find is a lot of the report is actually interactive. It's not a boring table. It's not just random images. You can actually click on things and mess around with things, highlight things, filter things. You can even make your own plots, which it's all, it's all very uh, powerful. So for example, Button here if you want to watch your tu tutorial video. If I highlight over the column headers, it can give you more descriptive columns, the column names. I can turn off some of my columns, so I can turn off these ones. And you can see there's different columns now. On the right hand side, you can download plots, you can uh, sorry, yeah, export plots, you can also rename certain files, and there's a b bunch of things you can play around with. So it's very, very, very powerful. You can also make your own custom plots, like press plot here, you can select two of the columns on the, well, that's not a very good example, but basically you can see that, um, Wait, let me find a slightly better one. Yeah, so you can customize your own plots here. Um, it's also interactive, so you can hover over any point on the plot as well, and it'll actually give you the precise values that were based on the table. So it's very, 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 very powerful in this regard. A bit easier for me now if I go like this. So there's a few things to think about. So the general stats table takes particular columns and particular information from the rest of the report to give you a very, very, very quick overview and summary where you can basically glance at it and you have a feeling of how good the pipeline or the data is. So one thing to notice, there are some cases multiple lines per sample, as you may see here. So you've got the ERR sample ending 6.1 and you've got three lines for this. This is because um, MultiQC works on file names to work out what the sample name is. And uh, if you consider the fact that if you have paired end data, you'll have 
two files, a, a forward file and a reverse file. And until you merge that in the adapter removal step, they'll be two separate. Then from after you've done the merging, it will be collapsed into one line here. So that's something to consider if you find that a bit confusing. Um, what you'll be looking for when you're looking at the general stats table is basically expect a number of reads. So you see the number of processed reads here. If you request the 10 million reads, you hope to see all of your samples should be uh, having that number. Of course, it will vary slightly, but if you see outliers, like one, one sample only has 10 reads, um, then maybe you need to go back to your sequencing facility to ask what went, what went wrong there. Um, like I said, I already said, you can customize the columns, they aren't flipping off and so on. I can't really give you what exactly to look for here because um, it depends on your data and your configuration, but this is something you'll learn over time through your intuition and sort of what you'll see in more detail in some of the later plots. So the next section of the uh, multi-QC report is FastQC. The FastQC is a tool which basically just reads in your raw um, uh, or typically your raw FastQ files and generates a bunch of, bunch of statistics. So for example, this number of reads in each library, it also try, tries to estimate approximately how many of these are duplicates, so exact copies because of amplification of the reads. It gives you statistics across from, um, so as a, like an average across all of your reads from base pair zero to 140 in this case and what the base quality score is. If you remember from our FastQ file yesterday, we had these random characters, which correspond to the probability or confidence of the machine that the base is correct. So you can see where, how good these are. Normally, and you can sort of see this slightly, that you're seeing a drop off in the number, the amount of quality as you come along the end of the molecule. This is what I was talking about with the quality going down, because the reagents are getting um, uh, tired. So you see, start seeing more errors. Normally, actually, you see these dropping off much further down into the yellow and red sections down here, which I think I have in the description. Oh, not in this one here. So this is something to look out for. Here is basically a sum. This plot is a summary of um, the base quality, like an average base quality score across the entire read. And you hope to see that all of your base, all of your reads basically have this um, peak up here. You may in some cases see that you have a second peak further down, which may indicate that one part of the flow cell was broken and give you lots of like low quality base calls. So you don't need to ignore that. Here, I'm going to skip that plot because I find it a bit difficult to describe. Sorry about that. So for the per GC content, um, normally you expect to see your uh, a peak around 50% as normal distribution because normally by chance, you expect to see 50% of your reads to, uh, bases to be GNC. Um, so normally you want to see something like this, which indicates that you have a very good balanced shotgun library, for example. However, in ancient DNA, you often will find skews to this due to contamination, adapters, and other artifacts. So normally I don't take this plot too seriously. Also given the work in metagenomics, um, this will be quite neutral in the middle. If you're dealing with specific uh, reference genome, so let's say mapping against a human reference genome or something like that, um, you may find that your GC content should peak around the same level as the GC content of the reference genome. That's something to check for. That may work for capture data from microbial, um, so ancient pathogen work, but this um, often, because we've got a metagenomic component anyway, will vary quite a lot. Base N content. Um, this corresponds to how many dead bases. So when basically the machine had no idea whether there's a base call called or not, you normally see a peak here. Um, but in this case, it looks very good. In these sort of case, like in the case of this plot and also the sequence quality histograms, if you see a drop off of the base quality scores down here, you normally want to basically do some trimming during the adapter removal step in addition to so the read itself in addition to the adapter removal bit. Switch up that one. So you can already, in fact, start checking to see um, how whether you have ancient DNA in your library based on the sequence length distribution. You expect your reads to be quite short as you have ancient DNA. So normally you want to see a peak, yeah, somewhere between 25 to 55, I'd say, maybe a percentage in some cases. And that would indicate already that you have good ancient DNA. 
Um, remember, you still have your adapters on at this point, so this will be a very flat curve in this particular plot. And if you have paired-end data, you'll often see a peak up here of anything that's 75 and more. But if you're already seeing a peak around this lower uh, short fragment length thing, that indicates you probably have good DNA, which is quite exciting. Duplication levels, this was mentioned before, if you have adapter, uh, sorry, if you've over-amplified your library or you have a lot of adapters in there, if you have this, this is probably adapters. This, uh, like a, a peak or, about, or a sort of elevated level around two, this may indicate you have a bit of over-amplification. That's normally okay, because you can remove most of these later on. If you have peaks much higher up, this is just that your entire library is possibly um, over-amplified, and so you need to go back and check the library construction itself. Over, over represented sequences, that can be if you have lots of adapters left in your library, in this case we don't have that, um, but you may also have vectors and there's other various things which may appear, although I rarely see this nowadays because cleanup steps in the lab are pretty good about this. Adapter content is another very good one for checking for ancient DNA. If you have very short reads, you very likely would also sequence the adapter itself because basically your cycles or more than the read length, and you read the, the adapter, as, as Tina and I also mentioned uh, on Monday. So if you start seeing that you have a high adapter content, even though multi, sorry, FastQC would probably report, as it has done here, that you've got some failures, actually this is a good sign when you come to ancient DNA. And this is also why I said the eager documentation can be very helpful in this context. I don't know if I can find that particular that one there. Here. So whereas for modern DNA you want to be completely flat, if you have modern DNA, this is probably not very good. You've got very short DNA, which is not good. This can make your life very difficult. But if you have ancient DNA, this is actually probably okay. Because what you do is once you remove your adapter, you'll be left with your actual fragmented, damaged, slightly rubbish DNA. But this is exactly what we want for ancient DNA. Uh, you can normally ignore the safest checks. Normally, FastQC will fail all of your samples because it's ancient DNA, because it's not nice, beautiful, long spaghetti like modern DNA. So I normally skip this and just look, look at the plots themselves. It's essentially just a summary of all the plots we just looked at. Um, adapter removal, I'm going to skip that in the FastQC report because the current version of uh, MultiQC has a, a, a faulty module for displaying the plots. However, in the release of Eager coming out probably tonight, um, fingers crossed, uh, has this fixed. Um, but here in this sort of plot, you can um, look to see do you have the vast majority of your reads have the adapters removed. Um, you can also look as well if you see after the adapter removal, the length plot, so read length plots, so that would look more like like this, whether you have, okay, so this plot actually works. So let me recap. So in this plot, what you would hope to see is that um, most of your reads have been truncated, indicating they've had the adapters removed, and also that they've been collapsed. When you have very short ancient DNA, when you've done paired end sequencing, you should see that the, 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 the forward and reverse reads will merge together. So you hope to see um, a large amount of orange, essentially. Unfortunately, this is a crappy plot because it has this retained reads thing. So I won't describe this anymore. But for the length distribution, you again want to see that after adapter removal, a peak in the number of reads, uh, which are at the short level. And that is a very, very good sign that you have um, ancient DNA. So if you're seeing this also after adapter removal, you are on again on the right lines. We then actually run FastQC a second time. So, uh, but this time we're using the uh, adapter clipped and merged reads as input. The reason why we do this, it allows you to compare between the forward, sorry, before, the before and after adapter removal steps to check to see whether actually the adapter removal works correctly. So again, to use the adapter content plots as an example, here in the pre-trimming step, we see that we have lots of adapter, which we do want to remove because we do not want to see carp in our um, taxonomic profiling or pathogen screening. So we've run adapter removal here, and then if we check the adapter content of the post-trimming FastQC, you can see we're all in green, lots of beautiful green, indicating that you have very, very few reads now left um, with adapters in it, um, which uh, is a good thing. So basically for most of these plots, you can go check and compare between the before and after 
to see whether basically you have more green, better values to indicate you continue. So after the trimming, and after the second round of fast see the first step, what we normally do in eager is to do the mapping against some form of reference genome. If you are doing, let's say, metagenomic screening or microbiome work, normally you would map against the human reference genome to actually remove the human DNA from the taxonomic profiling. But if you're running with pathogen screening, this is actually an important one for you because it tells you how many MAP3s you had. So normally what you want to see, ideally, is that the number of mapped reads is as close as possible to the input reads at the top over here. However, realistically, as we have very metagenomic, a lot of environmental contamination, um, you have, you'll have seen lower amounts here. But two to four million is actually very good in this case. I think that's because the input data are capture, the results of capture. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is a good sign. The more reads you have, mapped reads you have, generally, the better it, uh, it is. Uh, you will not basically see the rest of these values here, so you can ignore these. I'm on my phone, thinking Google is speaking. Let's shut up. Um, now, after you've done the mapping against the reference genome, this is typically done with BWA. So you've compared all of your reads against the reference genome and found out where they came from. Um, an important step is then to do duplicate removal. So like we said uh, earlier, yesterday in, in, in this morning, when you're building the library, you have to do multiple rounds of amplification, which may result in lots of exact copies of the same original DNA molecule in your sample. Um, these exact molecule, those are duplicates, do not give you any more information and actually will skew many of your statistics and analyses downstream, giving you sort of false confidence in the quality uh, of your, let's say, variant cause. So we, what we do in eager, as Megan mentioned earlier, we do a deduplication step, typically by a tool called Picard Mark Duplicates. And what you want to see here is firstly that you have very few duplicates in the first place, but also that these are removed. So in this case, we have um, we actually have a lot of duplicates because we have capture data, which often does result just naturally in lots of duplicates. So what we want to see generally is in shock screening, in screening data, a lot of blue and very little black. Um, or if you have capture data having a big chunk of black, that is normally OK. But the smaller the amount of black, generally the better. So you want to have as few duplicates as possible. This is because if you have lots of duplicates, you will vastly reduce the number of mapped reads and confidence you have in the downstream analyses. So with this duplication information, you can also use this to actually estimate um, whether you can sequence more in your library. So like I said before, these duplicates are not informative. They do not give you any more extra information. Um, but if you have still lots and lots of unique reads, so fresh original reads in your molecule, in your library, sorry, that you wish to um, uh, analyze, um, you probably want to sequence deeper to get better coverage, better confidence in results. And our pre-seq is a tool which allows you to estimate um, whether you can sequence more. So this dashed line is a theoretical perfect library indicating, okay, um, I, you have no duplicates at all. So every read that you're sequencing is completely unique. But of course, if you have amplification, not in your library or over-amplified, lots of duplicates, not every molecule will be unique. And so what you'll start seeing is actually a plateauing of this line, where this plateau includes the duplicates, whereas this, the y-axis is just unique molecules. Um, but with this information, you can actually extrapolate whether you could sequence more. And normally what you want to do is keep sequencing until you reach this plateau. So in this case, I probably would not start sequencing more of these libraries because you've already reached the plateau. So the more you sequence, the less inf new information you're getting because you're just sequencing the duplicates is exactly because we do not hold any more information. Let me just check if I've missed anything on the slide. So like I said, I would recommend coming back to these slides in the future because they just tell, recap everything I'm saying, but with text and with the ticks and the warning marks indicating what you should be looking for in many cases. Ah, yes, so one thing I did miss, so something we did not run in the example pipeline run today is you did the metagenomic classification step of the pipeline. This requires large databases and takes a very long time, so we did not include it today. But normally what you're looking for in metagenomic classification, 
which is a step where you're taking your DNA molecules or your reads and comparing not against one reference genome, but hundreds of millions of reference genomes at one time. And what you want to see, therefore, is that as many of your reads are mapping or aligning or being classified by the classifier as possible. So you want to see as much blue as possible in this such a plot. However, again, because we're dealing with this tricky ancient DNA, which is a lot of contamination, and a lot of soil contamination, environmental contamination of species, which we um, have just have no reference genomes for, we've not been able to sequence them, we very do very, very regularly often see a lot of black, a lot of non map trees. So this is okay. But what you're sort of more important looking for is that of the map trees, how many are actually taxonomic assigned? So you'd actually have an exact taxonomic classification to this species or this genus or something like this. If you have very few taxonomically assigned reads, this can be a problem. This may indicate that you have a lot of very low complexity reads which map to hundreds of genomes at once, so you don't know where it comes from. So this is something you check for when you're doing your metagenomic classification. So to speed up again, we've looked at Flagstaff, we've looked at duplicate removal, we've looked at pre-seq. Next is damage profiler. Okay, so this is one of the most important things and where you probably would get most excited about when you're looking through a multi pc report. We're dealing with ancient DNA, and we want to see these smiley plots that Tina was talking about earlier. You want to see an elevation of your C to T damage at the beginning and ends of reads. So to go back very quickly back, go very quickly back to the slides, you want to see, in a normal uh, shotgun library where you've done no UD, UDG treatment, you should see these nice curves. This is what corresponds to the, the smiley plot. You want to see nice smooth plots of a decreasing um, sort of direction. Um, and generally, the higher the y value, uh, percentage value on the y axis, the better. This says you have more damage, so you can be more confident that the damage is actually real. Whereas if you have like a percent value of, I don't know, 0 0.1, that means that actually you just have noise and it's not actual real damage, which can, could be a problem. Um, so, uh, like Tina also showed earlier, and like how we have in the EG documentation, and again, pretty much what I'm saying today is just a repeat of the documentation. I'd recommend just going reading that if you want. So it was malt, malt, Kraken, sorry, one second. Check. We see damage. So you can also see if you have these bouncy plots, this is probably a sign you don't have enough reads to get a good damage plot. It's not necessarily bad, but you may need to consider if you have ample gratification. And you also need to consider this high level of um, high frequency also at the plateau part at the bottom, which may indicate a wrong reference genome. Also remember the difference that the team explained earlier this morning between single-stranded and double-stranded libraries, which you may see. If you have UDG half libraries, you will also probably see something like this, where you have only the first and maybe second base showing a bit of damage. That is normal for UDG half. Um, and if you have UGG4, you shouldn't see any damage at all. So remember these differences. And this is something to consider when downloading public, downloading public data. Um, if you're not exactly sure or engine metagenome data doesn't report exactly what metadata, it probably means that this information was not reported in the paper itself, but always you should go back and check in the paper itself in the, the, of the paper that you're using whether they perform any form of UGG treated treatment. We can also look at the read lengths. So this point in damage profiler, we're only looking at the mapped reads. So we don't we we um, should have removed essentially all of the modern reads, hopefully, because we've mapped against the genome of the ancient species we're interested in. And you should see something like this, where we have the nice clean peak here again around 40 base pairs. We still have a few reads which were unmerged for various reasons, which still peaking about 76, but the vast majority of reads should be around 35. So let's say 50 uh, base pairs. And this again indicates a good engine DNA library. So if you've got a UDG treated library and you also see, so you don't have any damage, but you still see short reads, that is probably a reasonable indicator that you have um, good engine DNA. So yeah, okay, now we're in the quality map. So also when you've done mapping, so again, this is mostly relevant to people doing, let's say, pathogen pathogenomic recent construction. You can also look at um, coverage histograms. So this tells you how many times your reads have been um, at a given position of your reference genome being covered by your reads. That was a bit confusing. But basically on your reference genome, you have your reads mapping. 
And you, what you want is to have as many unique reads map, uh, covering a position of the genome as possible. And this graph or histogram gives you an estimate of this information. So in this case, at any given position, or at, let's say 100,000 positions of the reference genome, there have been at least 15 reads covering that position. And in this plot, the higher the number of reads, at a higher the number of x-axis uh, value you have, the better. The higher coverage you have, so the higher numbers of reads covering a given position, um, the better, because this means you have more confidence in whatever SNP calling you would do in phylogenetic reconstruction, uh, yeah, the high confidence you have. More often than not, though, however, you will see low values. So in this case, it's capture data, so you've been enriched for a particular Yersinia pestis sample. Um, so this is pretty good. Normally, you see something around 0 to 5 or 0 to 10. Um, but you must be very, very careful when you're at very low levels because you may not have enough confidence or enough information to reliably build, let's say, phylogenetic trees. Now, same goes to breadth coverage. So whereas this X coverage I was referencing to is sort of the number of reads um, covering a given one position, you also want to look at whether the entire genome has been covered or not. So this plot tells you, let's say, at 90% of the genome, the reference genome that's been covered, has been covered at least six times or more. And again, the higher the better. So you want to see a slope which basically comes as far over here and then stops dropping down on the lower coverage. Again, if you have a, not such a screening data or an unwell-preserved sample, your curve is more likely to drop down here very quickly and plateau at the bottom. Again, it's not necessarily bad when you're dealing with ancient DNA, but it's going to make your downstream analysis more tricky and you'll have less confidence in how this image is done. So this is something else to look out for. Finally, your GC content distribution um, should again match that at the quality map level of, of the reference genome you've mapped to. Um, so let's say uh, Tannerella facithia has a GC content of, I don't know, 65%. Uh, and you can often see this, let's say, on the NCBI genome website. You should check to see, does your genome approximately have a peak around the same point? Not necessarily bad if not, because we have um, cross-mapping contamination. This is something that Alexander, I think, will talk about uh, on Thursday. Um, but it's something to look out for. And now, finally, in the multi-QC report at the bottom, you also have all the versions of all the tools that uh, is including the pipeline. Note that not all the tools have been used in your pipeline run, so you do have to check this. This will actually change in Eager 3 when that comes out in a few months, I hope. Um, but at least this is very useful for when you're writing your method sections to know exactly what versions you ran and what you may um, need to report in addition to the publication, but the version in the name of reproducible science. Um, Okay, and so if you had run um, a multi-VCF analyzer, which I don't have in this eager report, sorry, multi-VCF report, you can also use this to check um, the level of contamination you may have when doing a pathogen reconstruction. So let's say you have Yersinia pestis. There is a soil relative called Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, which may also map in large parts to the reference genome of Yersinia pestis. Um, and so one way to check whether you have con such contamination is to see how many multi-allelic multi positions you have there. So what I mean by that is that you see in your pestis is bacteria, and bacteria generally only have one chromosome, so there's a haploid genome. And so you only ever expect to see a single SNP or a single variant at any given position. If you start seeing multiple possible uh, SNPs or variants, this indicates that you have reads that are probably coming from a different organism indicating uh, cross-contamination. So what you want to look for in the multi-QC output, sorry, uh, multi-DCF analyzer output, if you, if you run that module, is whether you have high number of heterozygous SNPs. So this is an indicator of cross-contamination. Um, you also want to look for too high or too low SNP values. This may indicate that you did not have enough coverage, or it may indicate um, that you um, have a very, very distant rel relative of your reference genome, um, or a high number of discarded SNPs, which suggests you do not have confidence you're very important. So to summarize, that was probably a bit long, a bit dry, and it's probably a bit boring to listen to at the end of the day, so apologize about that. Um, remember, a lot of this you're gonna learn through experience. And in fact, a lot of bioinformatics is that. 
you can't really read so much to get a thorough understanding you have to do. Um, so don't worry if you feel a bit lightheaded at the moment or a bit confused. But just to recap briefly of the NFPE output, there's various fast, uh, for output, output formats you may find. So fastq files, BAM files, let me see if we've produced that at all here. Aha, so I plan to compute in the end, that's good. If I go into the results directory, um, pipe, pipe. You'll, to recap, you'll see lots of different files, but typically you see fastq files, you will see uh, log files, but you should see somewhere BAM files, for example, here. So the BAM files are your mapped reads. You see log files and they report and so on. You may also have FASTA files, VCF files, and things like this. Which one you use depends entirely on your analysis you want to run downstream. Um, but Eager tries to supply as much choice to the user as possible, so you find everything you possibly can both apples and log files, you just have it explore, poke around, try heading, catting, and things like this. For the multi-QC plots and the report, there's many, many plots. So just explore. Um, again, it takes experience and feeling to rapidly evaluate, but by having it very interactive, you can poke around, play around, get a good overview. When you're quality controlling the pipeline, you're normally looking for outliers. Um, and so if you find those outliers, it tells you to go investigate them more or just discard them from your downstream analysis. And be aware from many of the steps, of many of the tools, they may fa report failures of the module that is not necessarily correct because these are always designed for modern DNA. So always read the NFQE documentation to give you an idea of if that is the case or not. Well, hopefully this documentation will be your best friend in all of this sort of so otherwise, that is the end of the presentation part of this. And I'd like to ask, are there any questions? And yeah, there was a helpful yep. question in the chat that might be useful. Um, uh, from, from Maria. From Maria. So the question was, do you map to the human genome first if you have metagenomic samples and you don't know the reference for? I recommend doing that. Um, the reason why is that the human DNA will be the largest contaminant in your samples and is also the most common contaminant in online reference genomes. This is because humans are dirty uh, and a lot of modern labs are not very clean. And so you end up incorporating human DNA into the reference genomes, which they publish. And then for us, you have archeologists, you have you, you have museum curators, you have your PI on TV licking skulls or something like that. All of that is cont contributing to the human contamination. And so to reduce the number of false positives, when I'm doing metagenomic screening or met metagenomic profiling, I would always remove the human DNA before aligning to the reference genome there. I also said that yeah. from a pathogen, like from single genome pathogen perspective, it's also useful because you can assess like damage on reads mapping to the human genome. Even like say, say you're, you haven't done capture for a pathogen yet, but you're assessing shotgun data. You can get some idea of if the DNA looks ancient by looking at the human reads before you send your sample for capture. Yeah. And also, if you're finding both yeah, human, ancient human DNA and ancient pathogen DNA, that's a great sign that you've got a very good sample. So UT asks, did you mention that regions with higher sequence duplication levels may indicate adapters? Um, yes, it can do. So ideally, your adapters should have already been removed uh, early on with the adapter removal step. Depending on your um, adapter removal settings, you may not always uh, have that. So sorry, I just want to get my multi QC report up again. Oh, which I think I finally closed. But if you still have um, adapters in your um, library and you have adapters in your reference genome, what you'll very likely you will find is that you see stacking, if you imagine the alignment, uh, something that Alexander will probably show tomorrow, or no, sorry, on, on Thursday, um, of stacking of reads against the adapters in the reference genome. And when you have such, so where they all align at the same point in the reference genome, and that means that you'll have very high duplication levels at that point, if that answers your question. Okay, there's a yes. 
Cool. Are there any other questions? And they can be very simple and basic. It's fine. If I just went too fast at a section, I can recap something if necessary. No. Maybe we can just, can I mention something? Yep. Yeah. I just wanted to mention that for the actual eager command that we ran, I updated the slides. So it should work now if you weren't able to, I'll double check it, but um, it should work if you weren't able to run it. So yeah, sorry about the typo. Um, maybe should we get an idea of how many people did actually were able to run it? Yeah, come on. yeah, so maybe if you were actually able to run it in the end and it's either running or finished, you can give a thumbs up. Okay, that's good. Buffered? Oh no, <laughs> okay, maybe so half, most, maybe most, more than half. More than half, okay. yeah, yeah. most people. Yes, you can run eager on anything you want. Um, the main limitation will be when you're doing um, metagenomic profiling will be the database size and whether it fits into memory or not. Normally, if you're aligning against the pathogen genome, you can easy, quite easily run on a, on a good computer. Um, can I ask, like, what are the steps that you will do after, for example, you, you have some eats from your metagenomic uh, profiling? Uh, so normally what you would do, let's say, so was that Maria? I couldn't see who was talking there. Yes, it was me. Yeah. Um, so let's say you take the uh, pipeline diagram or what is this doing? At least the way I would run analysis normally and what I did in my paper from last year, I would run the blue line so basically map against the human reference genome and then take the off-target reads, oops, and do a couple of filtering steps, run it against something like Malt or Kraken, which will basically align against lots and lots and lots of reference genomes. With that, I would say, okay, I look through the results and say, well, I see that there's lots of reads aligning against a noticing the pestis, or if you take a microbiome sample, Tanaria fasitia and pseudopropionium vectum propionicum, and I don't know, only bacteria in Durham. And so if I think that they are lots of reads, I would then download those reference genomes from NCBI genome, for example, then rerun eager. Um, but instead of the human reference genome, I would uh, align, use the, the let's say, the reference genome uh, and do the rest of the steps sort of following the yellow line in this case. So sort of a two-step two thing. You run the blue line to basically screen to identify your candidate. Then I'll go back and rerun, but with the genomics steps, uh, you're following yellow lines, possibly even to multi vcf right as a level. Because this gives me the, my estimate of whether my, the, my mappings had contamination or not. And what would you say? It's a, a good uh, amount of eat. That depends. Yeah, that depends entirely on, your, on the context. So um, if you have very few reads, um, it may indicate you need to do more sequencing or you need to try and do a capture approach. Um, if you have a species like Streptococcus mutans, you may get hundreds of millions of reads. But the problem there is there are many, 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 let's, if you take calculus or the oral microbiome, you have many, many Streptococci species in there. So you can't necessarily tell you whether it's a single strain or not. So then you would have to go back to your um, mapping approach, try and map again Streptococcus mutants and see how much cost mapping you have. I don't really have a good answer what's <laughs> for if you do have lots of mapping from lots of different species, because I try. I had this problem in my paper from last year. I tried doing a competitive mapping approach where I tried to map against with the BWA, lots of uh, structural reference genomes at the same time to see if they would pull away the contaminants or the, the off-target reads, but that didn't work very well, unfortunately, because we didn't have enough coverage. Um, so you have to look into other approaches, um, which is still, there's no standard, I would say, at the moment to, to do. Um, I would say if you have enough reads to get a damage profile, that is worth investigating. 
And I think in the paper, another paper I was in from 2020, so it's Man Natal 2020 in Quaternary International, when we're looking at um, dietary DNA, actually, but it doesn't really matter, is we found that I think if you have 500 reads or more aligning to reference genome, you can probably get a good re a damage pattern out of that. So normally, if you have that, you can check the damage patterns. But this does not exclude re samples which may have less than this. It's just you have to check more carefully.